Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, okay, so I put together basically a bit on what I call intrusion detection. Can everybody see this? Is it, do we need to dim the lights in here? Are we good? Okay, because it's going to literally look like this the entire presentation. So get ready for that. Um, but anyway, uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about what, what I'm calling intrusion detection and what that means in a multi cloud environment or in a container Kubernetes type environment. And just letting you know now, uh, I'm a software engineer by trade. I, I write a lot of C and C. I work very low levels. So this is uh, going to be more of a higher level talk for me, but um, we'll see how this goes over. Um, so anyway, uh, to get started, same problem as last night. Can we still see this here? Yep. Cool. There we go. Um, is that too small? Should I zoom in? Let's try this. Nope. All right. I might have to change my resolution, but we'll. We'll start off here. We can read it. Okay, cool. Um, if, if anybody wants me to slow down or, or read anything verbatim, I'm happy to. And also, I can send you all a link to the source for this if you're interested. It's all just plain text. Okay, so the name of the talk tonight is Intrusion Detection in a Containerized or Kubernetes like environment. Who here runs containers or would like to run containers? Who here runs Kubernetes? I just want to get an idea for who I'm talking to. I see Liz's hand up. Good to see Liz. Hi, everyone else. Okay, so about half of the folks here are running Kubernetes. So I'll do my best to kind of give context where needed. But if anybody has any questions, this is a very relaxed talk. Please raise your hand, yell, jump up and down. I'm happy to answer anything. I've been working in this space for a very long time, and I've got a lot of opinions, for lack of a better word, on, on how this whole thing is supposed to go. Okay, so let's talk about uh, a little bit of my history and how I got here on the stage today and uh, kind of my background and my expertise. Uh, so I wrote the book on cloud native infrastructure, literally. Uh, it's called Cloud Native Infrastructure. It's an O'Reilly book. I encourage everyone here to buy several copies of it. Um, I do a lot of technical writing. I do a lot of blogs. I do a lot of demos. Uh, a lot of my career over the past two or three years has been on stage spreading for lack of a better term, the gospel of containers and, and Kubernetes with people all around the world. Um, and so I am here at Sysdig, which is a security company, and I think it's probably important to call out um, the reason I'm here at Sysdig, right? So if you look at uh, the second bullet point there under contributors, you see that I've been, I've been contributing to Kubernetes. I, I was working on COPS, which is a Kubernetes infrastructure tool. Um, when it first started, uh, I wrote Cubicorn, from scratch, which is a kubeadmin deployment tool. I worked on kubeadmin itself, and I helped kickstart um, this effort that a lot of folks are excited about right now called Cluster API. And the important thing to note about all of these tools is they're all put in place to work on any cloud. In other words, if you look at Kubernetes, the whole value here is you should be able to describe your application for any cloud, and you should be able to run that relatively the same, regardless if you're in Amazon or Google or you invented your own cloud from scratch or whatever. Um, and all of these tools, at some point in their history of starting out as a main function and getting to where they are today, had to solve the problem of how do we express generic ideas from one cloud to another while still caring about specific configuration bits for each cloud. Probably the easiest way to think about this is if we were deploying a Kubernetes cluster to, let's say, EC2, we would have to create um, an EC2 instance, which is basically a virtual machine. Now, if we were deploying a Kubernetes cluster to Azure, we would have a virtual machine. They're effectively the same pieces of technology with subtle differences with different names. So in Kubernetes, we try to represent all of these fundamental ideas by abstracting them a layer above what each cloud is calling them. And that's the APIs that we see with Kubernetes, COPS, Cubicorn, Cluster API, all of these tools up here that I've been working on. And this was just the infrastructure side of things. This was just, how in the heck do I get a Kubernetes cluster up and running? Um, 
Furthermore, I've contributed to the Go programming language, I've contributed to Linux, to FreeBSD, and we're gonna get a little bit more into uh, why that's relevant for where I am today. Um, so, moving forward, uh, like I said, I'm an advocate, I've worked on Kubernetes, I just got into security, I'm, when I say hacking, I really just mean like, I'm really obsessed with difficult problems to solve on a computer, and I will just sit there and hack away at it until I can figure out a solution. And that's just something that I honestly just enjoy as a, as a software engineer. But why am I at Sysdig? So in my mind, the infrastructure problem with Kubernetes across cloud is well on its way to being solved. We've already looked at storage, we've already looked at network, we've already looked at compute, and these are the three fundamental building blocks of any Kubernetes cluster or any cloud and if you look at anything in computer science, it usually revolves around one or more of these three fundamental ideas. And if you look at my history from work, I started out writing in Scala and C++ at SolidFire. We went into NetApp, and we started to work on the storage layers. I then moved on to a small company in Boulder called Deus. We went into Microsoft, which is where I joined the compute team. See the pattern here? Uh, so the compute side of things, and I worked on Azure and Kubernetes service in Azure. I later joined Heptio, based out of Seattle, and we recently went through an acquisition into VMware. And that's where we took all three of these lessons and we put them together, and we called that Kubernetes, and that was what we specialized in. So looking at the, the systems that we're building across clouds holistically, there was one thing that there's not a good solution for. There's one thing that has yet to be solved. There's one thing that I could go and hack on, and that was security. How do we start securing systems multi-cloud? And if you think about this, it's, it's actually a pretty simple idea. Um, so if I walked up to an Amazon cloud, they have CloudWatch, they have all types of great tools, and I could build out an entire ecosystem around the tooling in Amazon, but if I wanted to move to Google, all of a sudden, these security tools are completely irrelevant. All of the work my team has done for building an Amazon to secure our systems doesn't plug into Google very well. So what's the common ground here? What's the USB for security in the cloud? And that's what I want to talk about today, and that's what I want to show you today from the command line, which is how, by special, using my specialized work at the kernel level of a system, we're able to build an agnostic set of tools that give you security privileges and security information and observability information regardless of what cloud you're running in, regardless if you're in Amazon, regardless if you're in Google, regardless of if you're in IBM or whatever cloud. And we do that by standardizing on the one piece of common ground, the Linux kernel. So who here knows what a C group is? Who here is scared of this word? Couple hands went up. Yes, Liz's hand went up high. Uh, so I'm not gonna explain in a lot of detail what C groups are, but this is a very powerful primitive. If you look at the three components I mentioned earlier, compute, network, and storage, C groups take it a step further and give us an ability to restrict, or even if you say it, if you read what it says in the man page here, uh, whose usage of various types of resources can then be limited and monitored. So if it's storage, we can limit it. If it's network, we can limit it. If it's compute, we can limit it. And we can monitor this as well. So all a C group allows us to do is as a systems administrator, as a software engineer, as an infrastructure engineer, we can say, my process shall not use more than 50 megabytes of memory, shall not use more than two cores of my available six cores, and I can limit what we can and can't do with this process. And if the process attempts to violate any of these limitations, there is one almighty layer of the system that can take action. And that's the layer that's abstracting away our hardware that is the core of how our systems work, the Linux kernel. And so C groups use the kernel to govern what applications can and cannot do. Traditionally, if you were to write an application on a system and your application started writing logs to disk, and putting information in memory. We've all here have seen deadlock, I'm sure. We've all here have seen a system that has been used and abused and there's no resources left available. What C groups allow us to do 
is they allow us to bring that level down below what is truly available on the system. And from the processor's perspective, that is the system. So we might have 10 gigabytes of memory available, but from the processor's perspective, we could limit that to one, five, seven, or none. And that process will not be liable to break our systems. Next, we have this idea called namespaces. Now this is more of, ooh, well, I mean, that looks kind of cool, but I don't think that's what we want. I'm gonna stop walking and see if it gets better. Uh, namespaces are more of a runtime way of, of doing basically the same thing. I, I can't make this up. This is just something's going on here. Uh, I'm gonna stand still and see what happens. Nope. Okay, we're just gonna, ugh. I don't know what's going on with the HDMI cable here, folks. I'm gonna try to replug it back in and see if that fixes it. Okay. The universal IT repair sequence. Maybe? Waiting? Okay. It still looks a bit fuzzy. Maybe it's the plug down here. Okay, well, I'm just gonna keep going for now because ugh, every time I say it, maybe I just shouldn't say I'm gonna keep going. I'm not gonna keep going. Nope, still doesn't work. Do we wanna try a different plug maybe? Um, resolution is 1920 by 1080. I have a different HDMI we can try to use to see if maybe it's my port. Let's see what this does. Yeah, there's a loose pen or something somewhere. Do you have a different way of plugging in maybe? Does anybody have any good jokes? I mean, I can still keep ranting if we want. Should we try to turn the resolution down just to see what happens? Let's try that. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, get, get on up here. Let's do it. Okay, I think this is good. All right, so we were here at namespaces. So again, getting back on track, all namespaces do is they allow us to separate what a process can and can't access. So this is access control, right? So C groups, what a process can and cannot use. Namespaces, what a process can and cannot access in relevance to other processes on the host system. Now this is, this is what's important when you start looking at containers and Kubernetes. Like we've all heard somebody say, well containers have a unique layer of isolation that you don't see with hypervisors and virtual machines. And this is precisely what we're talking about, 
is we're using the kernel to describe the limitations of both how it communicates with other processes as well as what it can and cannot use. And we do that by basically synthesizing what the underlying system looks like. So there are a lot of very brilliant engineers from around the world who get together and work on the Linux kernel. We have some of them who are employed at the same employer that I am called Sysdig. And we have written some really interesting software that allows us to gain visibility into these different levels of the kernel. And the big pattern here, the big takeaway here, is because we're able to gain visibility from the kernel, we're able to pull you, a consumer, or user of our open source tools, away from the kernel and make it as relevant as possible for you as a systems administrator or software engineer. So you don't have to necessarily care about what the difference between the C group namespace or the user namespace or the PID namespace is, although in a moment you're gonna see why the PID namespace is very important. Um, you're just able to write basic rules that allow you to govern these systems and that's where this intrusion detection comes into play. And because these are all generic across every Linux server, every cloud that runs Linux, pretty much all of them, um, is subject to this intrusion detection layer of software. So, this is all the code we're gonna look at, I promise, and it's actually not that complicated. It's a comment, and then it's three very similar lines of code, and we're gonna walk through each one, one at a time, and it's gonna be the same idea, but with subtle differences between each of the examples. So, if you look, we have three calls to a function called clone, and this is how from software, and this is the big key here, this is all done at software, there's no hardware we have to manage here. From software, we're able to create new synthetic systems that we as users call containers. And Docker, any container runtime, Kubernetes, every containerized environment out there is effectively built on this technology. But you're abstracted away from it. And that's where Sysdig and Falco come into play. We're able to go a layer past this technology and to understand what's going on behind the scenes. So in the first example, we effectively are creating a new process using the C programming language on our system. If you do a PSOX on the Linux system, you'll actually see there's two PIDs, one with the newly created process and one with the old created process, in the exact same way that we would use the tool fork on traditional Linux systems. However, clone is a relatively new feature. It's a new syscall. In the second example, we see we're not only passing in the SIG child flag, but we're also passing in clone new PID. And this is where namespaces come into play. We're actually able to create a new PID namespace. And all this means is if I was in the original process and I listed every PID that was running on the system, I would see every PID that's running on the system. If I was in the newly created process that was created by a clone with this clone and new PID flag, and I listed all the PIDs that I had access to, I would see one, and it would be PID one, and that would be me. So you can see how we're starting to replicate systems and break our systems down into smaller subsections. And these subsections are represented by these flags. And these flags are configurable at runtime using tools like Kubernetes. So without being aware of what's going on at the clone level, of our system, we might change a small bit of YAML in Kubernetes or in Docker for any cloud and create a potentially hazardous or vulnerable process without even knowing about it. So here are some other tools you can use as a Linux user to start understanding what namespaces you can and cannot see. And if you want to snap a photo of this, I strongly encourage you to run some of these command line tools both on your host system as well as in a container running on your host system, as well as in a cloud of your choosing. And you're gonna notice drastically different outcomes from each of these, these command line tools. And the reason for that is because every instance of a shell or TTY in any of these environments is all gonna be bound by these clone flags that we just looked at in the Linux kernel. Okay, so takeaways here. Uh, number one, multi-cloud. Um, what's relevant here across clouds? One, we're able to audit at the kernel level. And I'm gonna show you a live demo of this here in a moment. Uh, and because we're able to audit at the kernel level, again, 
we're going to be able to see the same things regardless of where we're running. And we're not able to do this without running specialized software that we've developed. Furthermore, we're able to use kernel modules and the eBPF protocol to give us flexibility into how we're getting this information out of the kernel. And again, we're able to audit the same regardless of which cloud we're running in. Here in a moment, we're gonna look at running this in Amazon as well as on my host system. And we're gonna perform the exact same exercise against the kernel in all three environments. We're gonna do one on a regular old Linux server. I'm sure we've all ran applications on a Linux server before, yes? Uh, we're gonna do one just in a simple container, no different than a Docker run. And last but not least, we're gonna show it running in a cloud using Kubernetes. So why is this relevant? We're able to audit the application and understand what it's trying to do to the kernel because everything you do on a computer ultimately is boiled down into the fundamental building blocks of the kernel. Whether you're looking at your grandma's picture on Facebook or hacking into a bank, it all is gonna go through the kernel ultimately. And because we're auditing at that level, we liberate ourselves from which environment we're running in. And we're able to perform the same exercise regardless of environment and see how the kernel treats it all identical. Um, and again, this is gonna give us flexibility into auditing at the kernel level. So, intrusion detection with, con with containers. Here's what we're gonna start with. We're gonna use Linux namespaces to manipulate a system. In other words, I'm gonna have my Linux computer here on stage. I'm gonna create a container, and I'm gonna perform two experiments. One experiment is gonna be on my host, and the other one's gonna be in my container. And that's gonna show you how the kernel doesn't care where you're running, and why auditing from the kernel layer is the truly the only way to have a true generic cross-cloud experience. We're gonna use a tool called Falco, which is a security rules engine, and we're gonna use a tool called Sysdig, which is effectively like Wireshark is to networking, but for the kernel. It just allows us to pull a stream of information up from the kernel and look at it at the command line tool, which again, that's high level. <laughs> um, and we're gonna talk about running Falco and Kubernetes. We're gonna run it as a daemon set, so we're gonna have a piece of software running on every node in our Kubernetes cluster in Amazon, and we're gonna look at how we manage all that using a Kubernetes primitive called a config map. We're gonna talk about how we would use a Kubernetes operator to set it up, and we're gonna walk away knowing that auditing at the kernel level liberates you from concerning yourself which cloud you are running on. Okay, let's do a quick demo. I don't have network. So let's, let's see if I can get on. Escape conf, and what's the password? Who wants to tell me the password here? Multi-cloud, one word, all capitals. One person, multi-cloud? All capitals. Okay. Do do. Yep, that looks like we're good. Okay, so first things first. This is the fundamental software that empowers everything we're gonna do in our demo. And th this is a command line tool that uses two very important C and C++ libraries that allow us to understand what's going on at the kernel. And this is gonna look like a bunch of gibberish to most of you, it's gonna look like a bunch of noise, but we're gonna build on top of this noise until we get something that's meaningful for operators and engineers running in the cloud. So, first things first, let's look at the fire hose of data that we can get. Right, so we have a lot that's going on here. And this is, bear in mind, this is all of the kernel information that's happening on my laptop. This is one computer running on stage, and this is what our data looks like. So now imagine if we had a thousand servers which have significantly more resources with significantly more things going on than my laptop here. You can see how this begins to get very complex very quickly. So that's where Falco comes into play. Falco takes that same technology except for it only concerns itself with lines that would be potentially hazardous, something that would be potentially malicious, something that would be intrusive to you and your system. These types of intrusions that are made possible by these C groups and namespace resources we looked at earlier. So let's run Falco. And if you look, it's substantially more quiet. Nothing's really going on here because nothing's happening right now. Let's look at doing something malicious on my computer now. So if I was to, let's say, sudo up 
as my root user. And let's just touch a file in my path. We're all familiar with Linux paths, right? User, local, bin, we'll call it multi-cloud. If I was to do this and go back to Falco, you can see here we've generated an error. So what happened behind the scenes is we looked at all of the syscall information that's coming into Falco, and we said, aha, we noticed somebody did a write to the kernel. We noticed that write was in your path directory, and we noticed it was done by a root user, and here's some more information about it. Here's the command that was ran. Here's what the file was called. And because we're auditing at the kernel level, we're able to perform the same experiment in different environments and from the kernel's perspective, it's all gonna be identical. So, we'll start Falco over again. We'll get some space on the screen so we can separate all our commands. And this time, I'm gonna do a Docker run, and I'm just gonna pick a container. And I'll run a shell in this container. Pretty harmless, right? We've all run a Docker container before, no big deal. we got the exact same output from Falco because the exact same system calls were used. All we did was we just isolated that container. So from the kernel's perspective, it doesn't matter if you're running in a container or if you're running on a host. And that's why we're able to build systems that can scale across the cloud using these underlying Linux kernel resources. So if we're using these resources to, to build out our systems and we're getting this flexibility where we're able to create these wonderful experi experiments that run in different environments, why are we not auditing them at that level? Why, why would we entertain the idea of auditing them two or three levels above the, the features that even enable us to build multi-cloud environments? So, let's take it a step further. Let's go to Kubernetes. So here, I'm gonna do a cubectal get pods, the Falco namespace, and if you're not a Kubernetes user, don't worry. Basically, all I did here was I sent a request to an API server running in Amazon that said, tell me which containers are running in my EC2 account, and we got a list of two containers. And those containers are running the same software that I just ran live on my laptop, except for they're running in the cloud. So if we wanted to tail the logs for these containers that are running in the cloud, in the same way we were just looking at the logs on my laptop, we would use a command that would look something like this. And this time, you can see there's a lot more going on. Falco's already yelling at us because we're doing things in Kubernetes that are potentially hazardous. And I'm not gonna tell you which layer of software I use to create this Kubernetes cluster, but I am gonna tell you that it's one of the pieces of software that I myself put a lot of time into, and I feel a little bit safer picking on it because I know uh, some of these concerns may or may not be from yours truly. So anyway, um, if we want to create some space here, we might see some logs come through because there's a lot of things happening in my Kubernetes cluster. But again, if we ran that original sysdig command line tool, you could begin to imagine what it would look like in an AWS environment with three very large servers, substantially more information. So now we're gonna create the same Docker run experiment, except we're gonna do a cubectal exec. And it takes the exact same flags that Docker takes, minus IT. We're gonna call it nginx, and we're gonna tell it uh, to use image, uh, we'll just do this, IT nginx, and we'll just tell it to do the exact same command, bin bash. Uh, let's do, let me do a k run. k run nginx, again, k is just short for cubectal. Run nginx dash dash image nginx. Okay, and so now if I list pods, cubectal get pods, you can see we have two pods running, one of which is called scary, which we might get into that a little bit later if folks have questions. The other one is this nginx pod or container that I just created. And notice how namespaces work in Kubernetes. If I do the same command again, but in a different namespace, I'm now showing the containers running in a different namespace. And all this does is it just allows us to separate which containers can talk to each other. And guess how we're doing that? 
namespaces, and C groups. Um, and so that's why understanding these core features are just fundamental to understanding why Kubernetes is important. So if we were to exec into the Nginx pod in the same way we just exec into a pod running on my local laptop, it would look like this. The name of our pod, and we would run bin bash. So here we are. I have now created a TTY in a pod running in a cloud. And we could run this same container in any cloud using Kubernetes or even just using Docker or even writing our own container runtime because we can actually do that with a very small amount of code um, or using command line tools like the ones I uh, suggested earlier that are native on the majority of Linux systems. So here, we'll do our touch user local bin multi-cloud. And bear in mind, all I did was create a file in a known directory that is vulnerable or that gives you privileges that you otherwise wouldn't have. And guess what? I'm running Arch Linux. The container was running Debian. This is running EC2 Linux. They're all running the Linux kernel. So from the kernel's perspective, it's all the same regardless of what cloud you're running on. So this is an anomaly. We detected it, and it doesn't matter which cloud we're doing it in because we're auditing in at the kernel level. So takeaways for everyone here, please, if you don't have somebody on your team who has spent some time understanding why C groups and namespaces are relevant, it might be a valuable exercise to go through and start understanding these features as you start architecting applications for multi-cloud. Furthermore, if you are gonna start auditing from the kernel level, make sure that you're doing it uh, in a way that's conducive to running both in Kubernetes, both in containers, or both on a Linux system of your choosing. And by boiling things down to those fundamental building blocks at the kernel level, we now truly have a liberated experience to run our applications in any cloud, and we know that we will be able to detect the same events regardless of which cloud, which operating system, which version of Kubernetes, which version of the Docker runtime, which version of Cryo, all of it doesn't matter because it all ends up going through the kernel at the end of the day. So in order to have a true multi-cloud experience, we have to start at the fundamental layers and work up and not the other way around and starting at the top and working down. Who's got questions? Go for it. First of all, I like the uh, markdown line with the terminal. Thank you. Great question. So uh, just gonna echo it back so everybody can hear. Uh, the question was, is BPF the new Linux? And should we be developing our applications using BPF? So real quick, who here is familiar with eBPF? Okay, uh, who here is familiar with JavaScript? Okay, and HTML? Okay, eBPF is to Linux as JavaScript is to HTML, right? So JavaScript allows you to create logic. There are no if statements in HTML. There's no else statements in HTML. There are in JavaScript. How do we implement JavaScript in HTML? We basically over-engineered HTML comments and we made our server smart enough to interpret that. eBPF does the same thing for the Linux kernel. It allows us to write code that the kernel is smart enough to interpret to perform arbitrary logic. So it's not really a new Linux as much as it's a new avenue for engineers like myself, who maybe aren't the smartest Linux engineer who's been doing it for 30 years, to write simple programs that can do things like pull metrics out of the kernel that we wouldn't be able to do without recompiling the kernel and opening up a pull request and going through this entire process of contributing to Linux. So it gives us a building block on which we can write arbitrary logic for our company, for our security tool, for whatever, and use things that used to only be available at the kernel level in user land. Does that make sense? But will I have access to the same comparison primitives I have with Go when? With eBPF? Yeah. So, so the way that Go works is it, uh, basically a Go routine is built on um, a, a construct that you see in the C++ standard library, which is, it's called coroutine, C-O routine in C++. It's called a Go routine in Go. And they're very similar. 
but basically they're reasoned about at runtime. And what I mean by that is if I took uh, a graphing calculator that had one core and I was able to compile a Go program on that graphing calculator and run it, it would separate any Go routine onto one core. So no matter how many times you tried to ask for a concurrent process, it would still always run procedurally because we only have one core available. Now on my laptop I have eight cores. If I ran the exact same Go program on my laptop and I asked for a new concurrent process, runtime would be smart enough to separate that out against my cores so I could reason about them differently. It's a little more complex than that in C++, but at the kernel level, that's the software that allows you to separate against your cores. Right, so you're gonna be, yes, you'll be able to use different cores for it, but you're n in no way going to have the same high level abstractions that you see with Go, where you can just type Go. No, there's currently no APIs for Go. Right. To eBPF? eBPF is completely at a different layer. Like, Go doesn't even use glibc, right? Go completely reinvented glibc, and that's two layers above where eBPF runs. Question. What sort of overhead is there by running this monitoring system? Uh, so Falco? that's a great question, and we get asked that all the time. It's uh, it's written in C++, so it's lightning fast. And the way that it works is we have a 16 megabyte per core ring buffer, wow. right? Yeah. That we read from. So we have a very lightweight C++ program that's extremely fast and its primary job is just give me data, give me data, give me data out of the kernel. And then as that data comes through, we just do some light assertion on top of that. So relatively low overhead. And the way that it works is we distribute it across the cores natively in user land. So we're getting all of the concurrency or primitives that we were just talking about here. So very lightweight. Uh, we, we've seen people use it at very large scale. Thanks. Sure. It's really, I got lights in my eyes, so if you have your hand up, like, wave really loudly. Cool. I'm here if folks have questions about Kubernetes or containers or security or just want to say hi. Sure. So is it Kube Etzel? Is it Kube CTL? Is it Kube Kettle? I've heard every one of them. Okay. That was a new one. So the, the command we're talking about is this command here. Right. Uh, so there's a couple of answers here. I know. So uh, <laughs> folks, folks who wrote the command line tool, uh, Brian over at Google, he's the, one of the original architects, kube control, and, and I think this is actually documented in the Kubernetes right. source code. Uh, most people just say kube cuddle because it's fun and adorable. Two years ago, I, I made a joke where I moved over from kube cuddle to cubectal uh, just to mess with people on stage, and I've been doing it for so long, I actually just genuinely adopted it now, and that's just generally what I say. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, call it what you want, and, um, you know, as, as long as you do this, I think you're okay. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I like it. Yeah, Paul v and, uh, Phillips calls it Kube Kettle. That's what Duffy yeah, yeah. at VMware yeah, 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 calls yeah. it as well. So, yeah, Duffy as well. Yeah. But he also calls it Kubernetes. Yeah, right, and so. uh, Liz here, is she still here? Yeah, uh, there she is. Um, can I steal your, your, so Liz calls it Kubernetes. Cool, that's a good one. That's a new one, the, the helmsman. Yeah. Awesome, um, Chris, thank you so much. That was fantastic, so. Yeah, absolutely. All right, um, thank you everybody.